Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted that you've decided to join us. If you have seen us before, you know that we study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this series is entitled Revival and Reformation. And I can tell you that uh, this lesson is going to get us into the real meat of that question. It's entitled Reformation, The Willingness to Grow and Change, and it's a lesson number 10 in our series for September 7. We hope that you have your Bible ready and handy as we study together. You may want to look at some of the verses we'll be talking about. If you would like to use any of the materials that we prepare for this discussion, you can find them on our website at www.theox, that's T-H-E-O-X, dot O-R-G. Now that you have your Bible in hand, hopefully, let's say a word of prayer before we begin. Our wonderful Father, as we talk about the necessary steps that we need to go through to partake in your plan of salvation, may it become clearer to us and to all those who are listening is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. This lesson really is about a miraculous transformation, sometimes called a reformation that needs to take place in the life of every Christian. We will study the cases of the disciples before and after crucifixion weekend, as well as what happened after Pentecost. Peter's denial and repentance, hopefully you're all very familiar with those stories, and the story of the prodigal son, as well as the story of the man at the pool of Bethesda, which probably should be Bethzatha. Uh, Bethesda is a word that probably came along quite a long time later. Each of these cases shows us a remarkable change involved in the people there. Uh, what, about, what brought about those remarkable changes? Let's start out just to, just to orient ourselves a little bit to the general idea. Look at the case of Peter. We go first to Matthew 26 starting with verse 31. I'm reading from the Good News Bible. Then Jesus said to them, This very night all of you, now he's of course talking to the disciples, all of you will run away and leave me. For the scripture says God will kill the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. Which by the way, he's quoting from Zechariah. But after I am raised to life, I will go to Galilee ahead of you. So does Jesus know what's going to happen already? He does. Yes, yes. He does. He knows. Peter spoke up and said to Jesus, I will never leave you, even though all the rest do. Is he uh, vying for top pace and is the prime minister, or what's he looking for? Jesus said to Peter, I tell you that before the cock crows tonight, you will say three times that you do not know me. By the way, that of course happened in the home of Caiaphas, of the experience later that evening. And they have a beautiful temple built over that home with uh, many of the rooms have been reconstructed and you can visit it if you're in Jerusalem sometime soon where I was a couple weeks ago. Peter answered, I will never say that even if I have to die with you and all the other disciples said the same thing. And we don't have time to read the whole story but you know what happened that very evening, well actually the next morning, well, it was really that evening still probably, we don't know exactly what the timing was in the middle of the night, Peter had denied Jesus three times and with cock crowing it probably was morning. Um, but something changed and look at Acts 4, chapter 4, verse 5, starting with verse 5 now, just to see since we're talking about transformations here. The next day the Jewish leaders, the elders, and the teachers of the law gathered in Jerusalem. Now they had arrested Peter and John for performing this miracle, and they weren't supposed to be doing things like that, you know. God forbid that you heal anybody. They met with the, they met with the high priest Annas and with Caiaphas, John, Alex, Alexander, and the others who belonged to the high priest family. They made the apostles stand before them and ask them, how did you do this? What power have you got or whose name did you use? Now they should have known better than to ask that question, right? Why were they so interested in that information? Why was that question so important to them? Well, you remember 
a long time before when Jesus healed the blind man at the pool of Bethzatha. Mm -hmm. We're going to talk about that a little bit later. They said to him, <laughs> who healed you? And my always question, whenever, whenever I read that, I have to smile and say, how many people were wandering around in Jerusalem that could heal a blind man had been blind for 38 years? Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> There's only one reason why they wanted that information, and they wanted to use it to condemn them. There's no, there's no other reason for using that information. I mean, why? They knew perfect, they, there was not a question in the mind of anybody in that crowd who had done it, or, or whose name it was done in. What is so bad about a miracle now? I mean, right now, if you can do a miracle, everybody will believe in you. But back then, it sounds like they're trying to turn it around and say, well, miracles like this happen every day. We just don't know who, who it's coming from. Well, obviously, they knew better than that. But the problem in this case is, remember, who's, who's, who's asking the questions here? Pharisees. No. It isn't? It's not the Pharisees. Sadducees. And Hedron. Sadducees are asking the questions. What, is, what were the beliefs of Sadducees different from the Pharisees? Oh, they don't the believe resurrection. In resurrection. They don't believe in resurrection. They don't believe anybody who's dead can be raised to life ever. So how can you be performing miracles in the name of someone who, quote, is dead? That's the problem. So they wanted to straighten them out, mm -hmm. make sure that um, wherever power you're coming from, it isn't coming where you think it is? Yeah. Where would they say it was coming from? Well, what if they just said, by the power that John the Baptist worked? John the Baptist says it's the same problem. He's already lost his head. <laughs> well, but I mean. You can't have it. It has to be in the power of somebody who's alive for, for a, a sadistry to accept it. So if you start doing things in the name of people who are already dead, what are you implying? They must still have some power. They, must, they might even be still alive. Mm. Terrible thought. Yeah. <laughs> so Peter, full of the Holy Spirit. Now here's the Peter who was denying Jesus when a maid points her finger at him, answered them, leaders of the people and elders, if we are being questioned today about the good deed done to the lame man and how he was healed, then you should all know, and all the people of Israel should know. Is he, is he backing down? Is he hiding? Is he no? That this man stands here before you completely well through the power of the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. And they're all going, Whoa. you know, this this the, the, the oh. Sadducees must have turned purple when he said that. Gnashing their teeth. Yeah, whom you crucified and whom God raised from death. I mean, this is like stabbing them with a knife, yeah. okay? Jesus is the one whom the scripture says, a stone that the builders despised turned out to be the most important of all, and so forth. Salvation is to be found through him alone in all the world. There is no one else whom God has given who can save us. This guy who's dead and you don't believe can be raised from the dead. The members of the council were amazed to see how bold Peter and John were and to learn that they were ordinary men of no education. They realized then that they had been companions of Jesus. Hmm, what difference could that possibly make, I wonder? Well, Peter's experience certainly illustrated an incredible change. Before the crucifixion, we all know, he's denying Jesus three times. Each one of the disciples, in fact, thought they were perfectly capable of following Jesus, that they would follow him to the death, that they were capable of being prime ministers in his new earthly government. And what happened to them after, the Pente after Pentecost, let's say, after they had sort of realized the truth? In the beginning, they would, whatever they were going to do was under their own power. Mm -hmm. None of them really had a full picture of what Christ was all about. And he tried many times to get them on board. Mm -hmm. But after, to use a colloquialism, the penny had dropped they fully realized what was going on and got the whole picture and it changed them. Yeah. They realized they couldn't do it on their own. They went out and they said, I don't care what you do to us. Death doesn't scare me anymore. I am willing to die for Jesus. All I, all I care about is spreading the gospel. And that's exactly what Jesus would, had been trying to accomplish the whole time. Yeah. So revival, what does revival mean again? Back to life. New life, right? Did disciples have new life? 
Yes. Because it looks like it. It doesn't mean you're completely dead. It means the experience now is richer and deeper. So what, what happens when we move on to Reformation now? What, what comes next? Well, look at the story of James and John. Go to Luke 9. Begin with verse 51. As the time drew near when Jesus would be taken up to heaven, he made up his mind to, and set out on his way to Jerusalem. Now, if you know something about the uh, geography of, the, of Palestine, Samaria is between Galilee and Jerusalem. Okay? So he's in a, if you're in a hurry to get to Jerusalem, you, you bite your tongue as a Jew and you walk through to Samaritan territory. So he sent messengers ahead of, him, ahead of him who went into a village in Samaria to get everything ready for him. But the people there would not receive him because it was clear that he was on his way to Jerusalem. When the disciples James and John saw this, they said, Lord, do you want us to call fire down from heaven to destroy them? Why would they say something like that? In the power of Elijah. In the power of Elijah. Why would they mention that? Because Elijah called fire down. And it was just a few miles from where they were standing there in Samaria. Just a short distance from Samaria, Elijah sitting on a hill had called fire down and destroyed 150 men. He just, they came up there to arrest him and God says, and Elijah said, God, bring fire down on these people. Because zap and they're gone. Wasn't it two different times uh, in short and close sequence? Yes. So they were trying to be consistent. Yeah. So And then they got rebuked for it. Yeah. So there was something going on here that was not exactly understood. Mm -hmm. I, th I think it kind of reminds me of uh, Jonah, also in Nineveh. Mm -hmm. Jonah wanted them destroyed, but God said, you know, these are... These are people, you know, they should have a, a right to repent and come to the Lord, mm -hmm. you know, and yep. God even mentioned the animals in that case mm -hmm. yep. about Nineveh. What about all the animals that are there too, you know? We're too, we're too quick to want to destroy things. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't have time to go through all the subtle reasons why people say this, but it's quite possible that James and John were cousins of Jesus. And so, if we look at Matthew 20, we learn some interesting information about James and John. Matthew 20, starting with verse 20, Then the wife of Zebedee, that was James and John's father, came to Jesus with her two sons, bowed before him, and asked him a favor. Now, um, have you ever heard of a time when uh, a woman was believed to uh, have special influence when she asks for something? Called Mary. Called Mary. Okay. <laughs> What do you want? Jesus asked her. She answered, Promise me that these two sons of mine will sit at your right hand and your left when you are, in, when you are king. And of course, Jesus said, You don't know what you're asking for. Jesus answered the sons, Can you drink the cup of suffering that I'm about to drink? We can, they answered. You will indeed drink from my cup, Jesus told them, but I do not have the right to choose who will sit at my right hand and my left. These places belong to those for whom my Father has prepared them. So these are just some verses to give us a, a feel for what these people were like before they were changed. Many years later, John wrote some interesting verses. 1 John 2, starting with verse 1, I'm writing to you, my children, so that you will not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have someone who pleads with the Father on our behalf, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. And Christ himself is the means by which our sins are forgiven, and not our sins only, but also the sins of everyone. If we obey God's commands, then we are sure that we know Him. Those who say that they know Him, but do not obey His commands are liars, and there is no truth in them. All those who obey His word are people whose um, love for God has really been made perfect. This is how we can be sure that we are in union with God. Those who say that they remain in union with God should live just as Jesus Christ did. A little change. Tall order. Mm -hmm. I mean, how did he live? I, I mean, yeah. ask the question. The, how did he? How did he live? And we we look at it, and it was totally selfless. Mm -hmm. He did nothing but deal with his father in prayer and and fasting, and 
and then come out and work for others all day. Now, mm -hmm. is that what we're expected to do? Yes. Well, that's the ideal. Oh. Well, then, what's the lowest bar we can get? Yeah, yeah. hold on, uh -huh. now, hold on. Is now. that what we're going to ask? It's very easy to become discouraged as one looks over one's own personal experience. It's sure. so easy to make the same mistakes again and again. What can we do to change that pattern? Well, let's think about what's involved. Do any of us here doubt that God is able to do his part of the work? No. So, why doesn't it happen? Because we There's don't. somebody else involved. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Change must happen on a day-by-day -day basis. God will never force or manipulate our wills. He respects our freedom. The work of the Holy Spirit is to impress our minds, convict our hearts, and prompt us to do right. But the Holy Spirit will never take away our freedom or make choices for us. Each day we must choose to accept the Holy Spirit's guidance in our lives. We must be willing to allow the Holy Spirit to do His work in us while we co cooperate to the fullest extent possible. What does that work? Oh, I'm sorry. You're I'm going a little farther back here in the New Testament. I'm, I'm reading from Paul. Okay. And he says, um, you know, I try and try and try, and it just, I'm afflicted with this humanity, and it, it's just like there's just, there's always something wrong. I mm -hmm. can never seem to, 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 yeah, this is probably a little over exaggeration of what he's saying, but. But in a sense, he's kind of Im implying that to a degree, that he's kind of stuck here and he tries to do things and it turns out he's the, the, the wrong thing. And so I'm stuck here with this, I well, think it's called humanity or whatever, yeah. the, whatever it is. Talk and about Paul. Let me read you his words. So then, dear friends, as you always obeyed me when I was with you, this is Philippians 2, starting with verse 12, it is even more important that you obey me now while I'm away from you. Keep on working, uh, I'm sorry, keep on working with fear and trembling to complete your salvation because God is always at work in you to make you willing and able to obey his own purpose. Do everything without complaining or arguing so that you may be innocent and pure as God's perfect children and so forth. So then how do we, how do we tie that in together with some of the uh, disclaimers that Paul makes about himself. He's describing okay. his own experience there. Ellen Find White. that and read that. Yeah. Ellen White does it this way. Uh, I'd rather use her words. As, in, as finite, sinful man works out his own salvation with fear and trembling, it is God who works in him to will and to do of his own good pleasure. Stop right there. Okay. What's another word for that process? One word. The whole process? The whole process going on right there, one word. Cooperation? No. Creation. Cre yeah. It's, it's yeah. a whole new creation. Mm -hmm. It's not a tinkering with something that I've yeah. already got in me. God will not work without the cooperation of man. He must exercise his powers, that is us as human beings, must exercise our powers to the very utmost. He must place himself as an apt willing student in the school of Christ, and as he accepts the grace that is freely offered to him, the presence of Christ in the thought and in the heart will give him decision, decision of purpose to lay aside every weight of sin, that the heart may be filled with all the fullness of God and of his love. Fundamentals of Christian Education, page 134. That sounds like an... Go ahead, Jerry. How, how is that work happening, though? Yeah. I'm trying to see the work. You just keep saying work. His work. His work. Right. What is actually happening? Because, because I see Peter telling Jesus that I will not leave you. Mm -hmm. Then I see Mark and who was it? Uh, yeah, that yeah. they can take the cup and they can drink it. Mm -hmm. Well, they found out they couldn't do it. Mm -hmm. So maybe the work is to find out who we are inside to actually learn who we are. Because Peter, if he would have known who he was, he wouldn't have made that claim, I don't think. Do, would you think? If, if, well, if, if you he had, knew if he, had known he, was he was going gonna, to yeah. run, he, he wouldn't have made that, that fearless statement. Is, is, the, is the question you're asking, Gary, is that it's essential, part of this whole thing is to find out what we really are 
And until we do that, yeah, then we can't. We then can't. you'd have something to repent of. I mean, if you don't know who you are, how are you going to find out Here's what to repent from? One of my teachers back when I was working on my master's degree in religion, Dr. Edward Heppenstall, many of you know him by name because he wrote books and he was a teacher of many, many people, said these words, which I think describes the situation. He says, you cannot stamp out sin. You can only crowd it out. And you can't crowd it out. Well, you can crowd it out by, by <laughs> taking the time, by thinking about Jesus, by allowing the Holy Spirit to work in your lives. But you have to allow him. You have to make that choice. That's right. So you're, you you're, talking, you're using that word work again. Let the Holy Spirit work in your mm -hmm. life. And I'm trying to see exactly trying to get an image of what that work is doing when it's working. Okay. So and and, and we're, this, this lesson and actually our lesson for next week are both going to talk about that. Mm -hmm. Basically, it means if we focus on the life of Jesus and we think, okay, I would like to think and, and, and do and, and believe what Jesus did. If we, if we say, that's what I want to do. Each day I set out with that goal you know, I pray, okay, I want to do that, then the Holy Spirit will come in and He will make those changes in our brain. We may not understand how He does it, but He will work on our brain to make that possible. Yeah, what frustrates a lot of it is, a lot of us is that that process seems to be really, really slow. Mm -hmm. I, probably most of us have prayed the prayer, create in me mm -hmm. a clean heart. Yeah. And we get up off our knees and we say, all right, now I've got the clean heart. And yeah. then five seconds later, we're, f we're falling short. Mm -hmm. A couple of the examples we looked at suggest that there might be a knowledge deficit going on. Uh, when <coughs> Luke tells the story of calling down the fire on the Samaritans, Jesus goes on to say, you don't know what spirit you're in. You don't know. Mm -hmm. And when Mary comes, or, or Zebedee's wife comes mm -hmm. to him and says, make my sons sit on either side, mm -hmm. he says, you don't know what you're asking. That's right. And I think when we pray that prayer, create in me a clean heart, we really don't know what we're asking. And there's a big education process that needs to go mm -hmm. on before God can actually do for us what we're asking for, because we don't yet know what we're asking for. Mm -hmm. and, and I think we're slow learners. Do you think that process could go on if you don't make that prayer? No, I don't mm. think so. I think, you so I think, I think the prayer is, 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 is an essential part of it, but, but realize it is a process. He is the author and finisher, but the timeline is not set. But something's got to motivate that prayer in the first place. So you've got to realize who you are to be able to okay. ask to become something different. Okay, let's, let's, let's talk about that just briefly. We need to look... We need to look at the life of Jesus. We need to look at all of Scripture, and we need to say, do I really want to be like God? Do I really want to be like Jesus? Do I really? Because most of the people in our world don't want to be like Jesus. They may pretend like they would like to, and they say, yeah, that would be nice. Ken, what would make you want to be like Jesus? Getting to know Him. But why would you want to get to know Him? Let's go in a circle here. Yeah, okay. <laughs> You're well, talking about about um, the impulse. You can talk in, in, the, in the specific uh, entity that works on that. That's the Holy Spirit, we might say. Um, you're talking about uh, God impressing on your mind and in your will and your emotions, whatever goes on there. Um, uh, if, if that comes into your heart and Ken is talking to you, Ken is just doing the talking. It's, it's the Holy Spirit that is engendering those things. If you are reading a passage of Scripture, it would be the Holy Spirit that is engendering that desire. Or that would be my, my inclination. Yeah. I think there's something implied that's not there exactly in the Bible. One word comes to mind is insight. Mm -hmm. On the Passover before the crucifixion, they all thought they had it together, could handle anything. Yeah. Had the crucifixion, he was in the tomb, they were lying low. You can 
I think it's fair to surmise that they did a lot of soul searching and yep. they were in deep shock and it finally that's when things started to dawn. They, they'd been with him all this time. Mm -hmm. Now they started to really realize what was going on. Yep. This, this, Ken, this all sounds kind of uh, laissez faire. One just mm -hmm. lays around and waits for the Holy Spirit to motivate you or, or mm -hmm. what have you. And uh, um, let's assume that uh, uh, Gary has felt the spirit, so to speak, over here. Okay. Uh, how much does he put into this? Does he go gung ho? Does he go gung gangbusters? How well, much? You know, we we have an old well, Adventist pioneer, Joseph Bates. Mm -hmm. You know, and the whole story about him is, you know, he found the Sabbath. Uh, it went right into the Sabbath, and when he decided he wasn't going to do any alcohol, that's the way it was, man. Mm -hmm. And uh, what you're describing here to me and what we're discussing around this table and every other table I'm around these days, oh, well, you just wait for the Spirit to do something. And then, mm. I don't know. I don't know. Is no. there any discipline? Okay. Is there any like planning? Is there any... Is let there any... Okay. Okay, let me just respond. Willpower to here? What, what's going on? What happened in the lives of the disciples? When they... They, when, when Peter preached that sermon on Pentecost morning and they baptized 3,000 people, did they say, oh, let's see, I wonder what I should do next? Uh, hmm. No, I, I, think, I think the people who, who really understand this process can't keep quiet about it. I think the disciples went forth when they realized that Jesus was alive and they realized what he really had in mind for them, their lives were out. Now, I realize that not all of us can take off and just forget everything else behind us and spend all our time spreading the gospel. But my question would be, how much of our time, whatever we do, how much of our time do we actually spend trying to talk about Jesus? I find that it's even among Christians, it's incredibly difficult. I mean, it almost takes an act of Congress to get people to say, well, okay, I think we maybe ought to mention at least his name. Or we ought to pray for our patients, or we ought to something like that. What happened to the disciples over the period of, of learning to love Jesus? Because they, he was with them, they saw him. Mm -hmm. They wanted to, to be like that. Now, they had visions of an of a earthly kingdom in their mind, but they knew that the good they were walking on. Mm -hmm. when, that, when that died, when Jesus was killed, they had a horrendous emotional experience. Mm -hmm. yep. This was not head knowledge. This was real heartbreaking, and they were discouraged. Then when he rose, here was another tremendously <laughs> emotional experience. And what we see Peter doing here mm -hmm. is the result of that. Now, I think what we need is to spend enough time looking at Jesus and studying him until we begin to have that emotional experience where, where we can actually feel that we have some kind of emotional love it's so easy for us to make it a, yes, uh, he came down, he died, he, he died for me, da, da, that's great. And it really never gets below our cerebrum. Mm -hmm. And until it gets farther down, like it was in, in, in those disciples who had gone through that horribly emotional experience, it may never get anywhere with us either. So l let, me, let me pick up on that. Um, uh, where we're, I, I'm afraid there's a lot more we need to talk about, but you remember the story of Thomas. What happened to Thomas? The first, the night of, of, of resurrection night, he didn't happen to be there. And all the rest of the disciples said, hallelujah, Jesus has arised, he's, he's alive, whatever. And Thomas says, I'm not going to believe until I see it for myself. And Jesus showed up the week later, and what did he say? My Lord and my, my God. My Lord and my God. He, didn't, he just heard his voice and he took one look at him and he, that was it. Uh, don't we believe that seeing is believing? No, he, he was doing what Peter did before the, the crucifixion. He, he was operating basically the same on a different dimension. 
That okay. was his decision. I'm not going to believe till I see it. Peter just squared his shoulders and said, I'm the biggest and the baddest. Mm -hmm. But after, then he realized, yeah. he finally got inside. I think the key to a lot of what they did is they never gave up once they got the picture. Jesus said something very interesting to Thomas at the end of that discussion. Do you remember what he said? I wish the seen, people, you've other seen. people, you've, you've seen, but blessed are those or something like yes. that who will believe, who yes, didn't get the to Lord. stick their fingers in my yes. side. Do you believe because you see me? Verse 29, John 20. How happy are those who believe without seeing me. Why would he say that? That's a blessing for us. Because he knows about us. <laughs> well, but, but le le we need to go a little deeper than that. Why is it important for us to believe without seeing? The devil is going to show up one of these days, and he's going to have all the seeing you can possibly imagine. Oh, okay. I mean, look what Hollywood's already doing. Sure. Yeah. And the devil is going to go way beyond that. And if we're going to be blown away by seeing, we're in big trouble. So what Jesus is saying, you better know the truth. Don't wait to, oh, yeah, okay, I see it, that's all. I mean, the devil, we just, we'll, it'll be a walk in the park for the devil if we, if we believe only on seeing as believing. But I, you use the word no, mm -hmm. and I think you ought to use that in that biblical sense of no. Mm -hmm. we ought, it ought to be that intimate relationship no not just the no of a school knowledge of a, of a mm -hmm. book, but that kind that is, gets down in the middle of you. Yeah. Well, but there are different, different levels of this knowing. That's uh, what those of us about. sitting around this table, <laughs> we've had lots of opportunities, you know, as we present these, as we've studied our Bibles for years and so on, but there will be people that are converted shortly before Jesus comes, mm -hmm. and they, they may have never really known, had the opportunity to know him interpersonally as we have had, and to, and, and how are they going to, how are they going to, they're not going to know all of this stuff that we know, or that we think we know, how, wh what are these but, people going to do? But those people are going to know enough information so that they're going to say, I believe the Bible, and I refuse to accept Satan's counterfeit. That's what they need to know. Uh, take, let's take another story, because I want to keep us moving forward, because we're going to be running out of time before you know it. Mm -hmm. The prodigal son. We're all familiar with that story. Why did Jesus tell that story? Wonderful. Wonderful story. They're all wonderful stories, okay. of course. Yeah. Um, was Jesus trying to get us to believe that the Father in heaven is like the Father in that story? Mm -hmm. yeah. Even though we come back from the pigsty, he'll run to us, he'll put on the, the favorite coat, give us the credit card in the form of the family mm -hmm. ring. Okay. Do you think, uh, what do you think the father was thinking about the son while he was gone? He was missing him. Mm -hmm. um, Maybe writing him letters if he knew where he was. Yeah. The whole game. You think, you think the father ever spoke to the older son how he felt? Probably. If he did, then the older son didn't pick, didn't understand, didn't or rejected the message, the message entirely. Yeah. Right. I think the father worried about what any one of us, as being parents, would worry about. Yeah. So there's a whole gamut of stuff. So how difficult do you think would it be to decide whether you'd rather be in the pig pen or at the father's banquet table? Uh -huh. Well, don't you think he, that the father might have had banquets before? That yeah. might have been a thing that went on. Mm -hmm. So he'd had an opportunity to experience those mm -hmm. banquets. He chose something else. He chose to go get his own. Well, and he, when he finally got his banquet down in the pig pen, he said, I'd rather have my dad's banquet. Yeah. <laughs> Why do you think he waited so long to go home? Right. He's embarrassed. Pride, right, sure. It takes some people who get high up on Fool's Hill, it takes them a long time to come back. Mm -hmm. going to have some to meet don't his brother. come back. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and we have to overcome our, our shyness, our embarrassment, and uh, come back to the Father. 
always. What evidence do we have that the father was anxious for the son to come home? Every day. He saw him afar off means he was looking all the time. He was looking down that road. Well, do we truly realize how much God loves us? And how do we, how do we tell people? I, I work with people who have had pretty bad experiences in their lives, a lot of bad experiences. Some of them have no money, they have no place to stay, they're homeless, they're, et cetera, et cetera. How do you convince a person like that what true love is all about? Minister to them. Yeah, minister to them. It's never easy. Some of them have never had love from the beginning. That's right. So we could learn, if we really wanted to, to practice the attitudes, the habits, the thoughts, and feelings that Jesus had, if we really wanted to, couldn't we? You say, we could what? Do that again. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let me try again. The challenge here now, if we're going to learn to be like Jesus, that was the, that was the th thing we talked about back at the beginning. We need to learn attitudes, we need to learn habits, we need to learn thoughts, and we need to learn feelings. Okay? And these things, I mean, there's two choices. There are attitudes, habits, thoughts, and feelings that keep us away from God, and there's attitudes, habits, thoughts, and feelings that are like God. And how, how are we going to... Eight Testimonies, okay. 286. Okay. All that man needs to know, or can know, of God. That's what we're talking about here, isn't it? Mm -hmm. All that man needs to know, or can know, of God, has been revealed in the life and character of his Son. Now, if that's the information about God that we want to know, we've been told mm -hmm. where to go to get it. The only place you can find it. We may have been told, but may not have been, may not have perceived it yet, mm -hmm. because you do that learn. May, that may well be. Another story that we're supposed to talk about is the healing of the man at the pool, uh, pool of Beth Zapha or Bethesda in some cases. Um, why was he there? Did you get that pronunciation while you were down in the depths by that, by that pool? Or where did it come from? No, actually, it's in many of the modern translations. Oh, okay. Beth Zatha. Okay. Um, the pool, Bethesda means the pool of grace, or the house of grace. And that's a, that's, a, that's a Christian expression that probably came a long time later. Mm -hmm. Beth Zatha means the house of olives. It's much more likely to be what it was called in, in, in Bible times, in Jesus' day. Uh, and some of the older versions, some of the older manuscripts have that. Okay. So why are all those people there? My Bible doesn't say. Yeah, that's interesting. Mine doesn't except either, except in the footnote. In the footnote. <laughs> well, it was believed that if you got, if you were the, when, when the water moved in that pool, if you were the first one in, you would be healed. Now you got a whole bunch of people waiting around this pool. A lot of them with psychiatric problems, probably. <laughs> and <laughs> and when the pool get when the water gets stirred, who's going to be the first one in? And if you believe you're healed, you are. There you go. See. So this guy's been there for many years, probably coming and going. Go there for a while, doesn't, he's not successful, maybe his family carries him back home, then he comes back again, and there he is. And he's about to die, Ellen White says. And all of a sudden, Jesus comes walking along, and apparently at this point in time, he's all by himself. Now, I don't know where the disciples were, but he's all by himself. Do you think he intentionally went to that spot on that Sabbath? Absolutely. And why would he do that? Because he, he and his father had a conversation father. earlier. Yes, he had a conversation <laughs> with his the father. The night before, he and his father had it all planned out. Yeah, had it all planned out. He just walked up. He said to this man, you know, 
you are really got a problem here, son. Why don't you pick up your bed, take up your mat, just a little mat, roll it up, and go home. And what did the man, how did the man respond? I don't have anyone to put me in the water. Mm -hmm. And did Jesus bother to stop and argue with him about the water? Jesus asked him a question first. He said, do you want to get well? That, doesn't that seem like a waste of time? Yeah. <laughs> and it was after that question that the explanation about, yeah. I can't get in because there's yeah. nobody here. Right. Well, Jesus said to him, get up, pick up your mat, and walk. And what happened? Immediately the man got well. He picked up his mat and started walking. And what happened that made him realize he could get up and walk? There had to have been some physical feeling in his legs. Or he was looking into the eyes of Jesus, and Jesus said, do it. Right. And under that, he said, I, he made the try. Right. Mm -hmm. He made the try, and all of a sudden, it happened. Yep. His shriveled leg got bigger, stronger, and he was able to stand up. But I, I think that it got stronger as he was getting up. Mm -hmm. He tried to get up with his little tiny shriveled leg without seeing it swell and become normal. He, w he was doing what, by faith, what Jesus asked him to do, and then Jesus made it happen. Was Jesus, Jesus a complete stranger here, or did he have a yes. pretty good idea who Jesus was? He had no idea who was no. Jesus was, because a little later they asked him, who told you? And, and again, this is one of these laugh, <laughs> tongue-in-cheek, laugh-it-up-your-sleeve kind of situations. And the, the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees are saying, who told you to carry that mat on Sabbath? Who made you all well? They knew this guy. He'd been around, hanging around, and probably asked them to heal him for many, many times. They all knew him. And so they said, who healed you? And he said, I don't know. And they said, Hmm, I wonder who it could be. Mm. <laughs> no, this is a little puzzling. Yeah? You know, because um, salvation comes in f with faith in Jesus. Mm -hmm. Now, you need to know who you're having faith in, mm -hmm. or else anybody could come up and you can have faith in them and um, be healed. That's what it seems like would have happened if, if somebody told him to pick up his bed and walk and not identify himself. So well, this is what's puzzling to me that that would even happen. Well, but there's, there's a time there when Jesus' disciples come back complaining because there are other people who are healing in Jesus' name. <laughs> yeah. uh, it blows me away. Uh, to me, I think we've missed one thing. Uh, what you read in the New Testament, the life of Christ, he had a personality that ranged from extremely gentle to right in your face. He was mm -hmm. a man that was focused. Mm -hmm. And if you look at your own life experience, we've usually come across somebody who you knew, they knew what the, where they were going or what they were doing. I'm talking about here and now. Yeah. You can pick a tone or a look in somebody. Mm -hmm. and I think Christ probably had something that. I think he looked at that man like you suggested, and he said, take up your mat and walk. And the guy said, anything you say, sir. Yeah, exactly. He, he, you know? He could handle himself in any situation yeah. and did. Well, look at these words where Ellen White comments about this in Steps to Christ, page 51. If you believe the promise, believe that you're forgiven and cleansed. Now, she's applying it to our sinful lives and not just to the man at the Pool of Bethesda. God supplies the fact. You are made whole. Just as Christ gave the paralytic power to walk when the man believed that he was healed, it is so if you believe it. Do not wait to feel that you're made whole, but say, I believe it. It is so, not because I feel it, but because God has promised. Does that apply to Rob's question? Lord, create in me a clean heart. Yeah. Can you apply those words to that prayer? Well, let me, let me f focus or, or, or rephrase your question a little bit. Who has more likelihood of being correct, your feelings or God's word? 
God's word. <laughs> <laughs> so we, we sometimes don't think about it like that. But if God says, get up and walk, you say, well, I don't, feel, I don't feel like I can do that. No, you get up and walk. See, if you really believe God's word, then you move out and do it. See? But we have to put our feelings aside. The feelings aside, uh, but create in me a clean heart. Mm -hmm. If you believe it, it is so. So yeah. this whole idea, the power of positive thinking, no, is what is, we're talking about here? This is not the power of positive thinking. The power of positive thinking well, it means... it sounds like it. I mean, no, I, no, I know no. it isn't, but the, Hold way, on. the words you Hold use, it sounds like it is. Yeah. No, <laughs> the power of positive thinking means you thought up a good idea, and all of a sudden you're going to make it happen because you thought it up. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about God says to you, I will do this. Do you believe him or don't you believe him? We're talking about his promise. That's a very different situation. So you're talking about the difference between what God said versus what, what you're you thinking yeah. it should be. Yeah. Okay. Very different. Sounds like a good answer. So we must, what must we do to bring about such a transformation in our lives? And forgive me for making, reading so many quotations, but I, I hate to say this in my words when Ellen White does such a good job. Let no man present the idea that man has little or nothing to do in the great work of overcoming. For God does nothing for man without his cooperation. Neither say that after you have done all you can on your part, Jesus will help you. Christ has said, without me you can do nothing. So he's already helped you if you've gone there to ask. That's right. Yes. From first to last, man is to be a laborer, laborer together with God, unless the Holy Spirit works upon the human heart, at every step we shall stumble and fall. Man's efforts alone are nothing but worthlessness. But cooperation with Christ means a victory, because who said so? Jesus. God said so. Of ourselves we have no power to repent of sin. We can't even repent by ourselves. Unless we accept divine aid, we cannot take the first step toward the Savior. He says, I am Alpha. Where does Alpha come? The very beginning. beginning. The very beginning. And Omega, where does Omega come? The At the very end. The beginning and the end, Revelation 21, 6, in the salvation of every soul. But though Christ is everything, we are to inspire every man to unworried diligence. We are to strive wrestle, agonize, watch, pray, lest we shall be overcome by the wily foe. So what are, we, what are we doing? What we are doing is we're standing between the devil and God. And God, both of them are waiting for us to say, whose side do you want to be on? That's what's going on there. Well, and that watching and all that was in that last paragraph, well, that's a strive, like you've wrestle, got your, agonize, like you, watch. Yeah, right, like you've got your nose to the grindstone here. No, but... Is it worth it? But, but here, here, here's the question. You guys are talking about different things here. Well, oh, oh, hold on. <laughs> let's, let's you're contradicting you one got another. The grind, you got the grindstone knocked into it. <laughs> okay, but let's think about this a minute. If you let down your guard for a moment, who's going to jump in? Satan will. Satan right off. So what do you have to do if you want to overcome him? Keep your nose to the grindstone, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and this is not like you have to do some magic. You just have to be awake. You have to be aware of what this devil is up to so you can say, I choose God, I don't choose you. And that's really a constant thing. Because as we said before, she gives the illustration of when you look at the sun and then you look away and you see sunspots in yeah. everything that you see. Mm -hmm. And this connection of seeing Christ has to be yeah. that regular all day long. If you're thinking about that all the time, how are you going to do your work? <laughs> well, how are no, you gonna, no. Christ is going to help you do your work. Remember that mm -hmm. Jesus, this, this, no, hold on. We're, <laughs> Jesus is our example. Let's think about this. What did he do while he was walking from Galilee to Jerusalem? He was walking. You know, he, it's not like every single minute of every day he was doing some miraculous thing or doing something like that. He did his ordinary thing. So, so the reason I'm not doing that is 
the reason why I don't have all these people following along, scraping up food and money for me so that I can eat. And Jesus had all of these people contributing what? to his welfare. And Once again, and I would remind you that, and, and Ellen White says it, and I wish I had the quotation right in front of me here. She says, if we had the same attitude toward God and the same acceptance of the Holy Spirit, Jesus didn't do anything that we couldn't do. As a matter of fact, Oy vey. Jesus said we will do greater things than mm -hmm. him, which sounds impossible, but yet if we really dwell upon it, we can okay. and we do. When he said we will do greater things than him, did he mean that on a personal level for each of us? Did he mean that myself, I will do a greater act than him? Or did he mean us as, a human as humanity, as a church? Yes. He meant collectively we will do more than he did. Because we can be in more places. He could only be in one place at a time. Mm -hmm. And we have the ability, uh, Jesus fed miraculously. We have the ability through, you know, through our diligent work and whatnot to raise some funds. And it seems that we can actually, everyone out in TV land and listening on the internet can also go out and feed thousands of people. Okay, let me finish the quotation. This, by the way, comes from Notebook Leaflets, page 39, paragraph 1. Most people have never heard of that. I just put that in there because to put the date in, this was April 9 of 1893. It was something Ellen White scribbled in her diary, basically. It's found in Selective Messages, book 1, page 381, paragraph 2 and 3. It goes on to say, for the power and grace with which we can do this, all of these things we've been talking about, comes from our willpower? No, it comes from God. And all the while we are to trust in Him who is able to save to the uttermost all who come unto God by Him. Never leave the impression on the mind that there is little or nothing to do on the part of man, but rather teach man to cooperate with God that he may be success successful in overcoming. And then the next quotation that goes with it, all true obedience comes from the heart. It was heart work with Christ. He had to do this too. And if we consent, he will so identify himself with our thoughts. Now what do we have to do? Identify. Well, no, no, no. It so no. identify with himself? Well, no. Read. Well, if we uh, consent. If we yeah. consent, all we have to do is consent. Yeah. Is that a difficult thing to do? Well, it may be well, difficult for us to give yeah. up our human desires, That's but... Right. Physically, we can consent. That's not, that's not something that's beyond the capacity of anyone here or anyone listening. We're guaranteed that power. Okay. If we consent, that's our part, he will so identify himself with our thoughts and aims, so blend our hearts and minds into conformity to his will, that when obeying him, we shall be but carrying out our own impulses. Can we live lives like Jesus? If you believe those words, we can. That's right. The will, refined and sanctified, will find its highest delight in doing His service. When we know God as it is our privilege to know Him, what's the secret to doing this consenting and so forth? Know him. Knowing God. When we know God as it is our privilege to know Him, it's our privilege to know We don't, a lot of people, no, Almost no one does, but we have that pass. We have that possibility, as it is our privilege to know Him. Our life will be a life of continual obedience, through an appreciation of the character of Christ, through communion with God. Sin will become hateful to us. Desire of Ages, six sixty-eight. Through appreciation of the character of Christ. Yeah. How would we ever know that if we didn't if we didn't look at him and study him and comprehend? And that word consent, on one level, it sounds like something easy to do, but coming from a, a medical procedural background, and, and this idea of informed consent, I can't do for somebody something that they haven't I given informed consent for. That means they have to have a pretty good idea That's right. of what they're consenting to. And I think until we've done that in-depth, day-by-day, moment-by-moment study of Christ, we really don't know what we're consenting. Yeah. That's right. So what we're saying and what, you, what you've just implied is this. If we 
we read in the Bible, and we read maybe in the writings of Ellen White, we think about the life of Christ, we see what we, what's going on there. If we say, I like that, I want to be a part of that, and God says, okay, give me a chance, we'll work together. From what we just said uh, the last few minutes, shouldn't all obedience come from the mind rather than the heart? Well, remember that in the, in, in the Bible, the mind, they, they didn't comprehend really. Yeah. There, there was a time when they thought that the brain was an air conditioner for the, yeah. because you sweat a lot in your forehead. They didn't understand what all was going on there. They, to them, the heart was the place where you did your most involved thinking. Yeah. So that's, I think that's the implication there. Well, there are many promises in the New Testament. Just to mention a few, 1 John 1, 7 to 9, Philippians 4, 13, James 1, 5 to 8, Romans 8, 30, 31 to 39, I could go on. Basically, I like the one in Romans. Uh, let me read just a couple of verses from that. In view of, excuse me, Romans 8, 31, in view of all this, what can we say if God is for us, who can be against us? And then he goes on to say, the Holy Spirit's on our side, the Father's on our side, and surely we don't think Jesus is against us. So if God is for us, who can, I mean, be, against? Who can be against us? How can we possibly lose unless we just absolutely refuse to join their team? That's what we're talking about. It is. Yeah. Do you find it difficult to accept God's promises? In these verses, God has promised us that if we live in the light, He will purify us of sin. If we confess our sins, He will forgive our sins. Like Paul, we can do all things through Christ. If we pray for wisdom, God will give it. And if we trust God's promises, nothing can separate us from God's love. With that kind of assurance, how can we lose? So going on, what does it mean to work out our own salvation with fear and trembling in the last few seconds that we have for this session? God just is basically saying to us, give me a chance. Give me a chance. Give me some minutes. Give me an hour or two of every day. The, the, there are many, many promises. Uh, and I, we don't even come close to have all the time to talk about all of them. But if we give God a chance to work in our lives, the transformation, the revival will be amazing. Try it. See you next week.